Good, mo uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steven. You yeah. can hear us okay? Okay, good. Okay. Um, today we are talking about actively, actively doing, doing nothing. nothing. <laughs> um, we're going to have a little bit of fun because we're on the special track, and this yeah. is the this is the fun room. Yeah, this is a fun room. This is a boring room. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Let's begin. What is about actively doing nothing, Stephen? That's a very good question. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, mostly through examples, uh, some case studies. Um, we'll give you some ground rules around how we're going to play this talk as well, so you have an idea. Mm. What were you doing just now? Listening. Yes. What are you doing now? Observing. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you doing now? Looks like the first one, yeah. but maybe that's eavesdropping. Yes. Um, anyone think of these three things as key skills in your work? Anyone think? Yes? Uh, there's some at the back, yeah, so definitely. Um, these are definitely underrated key skills that a project manager, a scrum master, any type of role uh, can benefit a lot from. They're definitely intangible and they're definitely not very visible, uh, but we might be able to convince you reasons why some of these intangible or invisible things are actually quite useful. Yes. So here we are going to talk about like uh, uh, actively doing nothing is about supportive leadership. It's a balance between these two types, right? Uh, it's obviously from the enter room to the other end of the room. There is something called, uh, there is leaders that are doing nothing, also known as lazy. Yeah, and also another leader type at the other end of the rooms who doing everything, also known as bossy. Do this and do that. So when we talk about supportive leadership, it's not always about at the middle. Right, it's, uh, it's supportive leadership. It depends on the situation where, like, uh, sometimes when the team needs support, it's a kind of a balance on how we could like resolve the bottleneck, how we could support them to do better, or sometimes it's uh, about to find the right balance of having enough space for them, having enough freedom for them to run things, to try new things, to improve things. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go through some ground rules, um, nothing scary, just to set the scene a little bit and give you an idea of what our talk is about and also what it's not about. Yes. So we'll go through one by one. Uh, the first one, this talk is not about any specific role. So we're not talking about uh, competencies to be a good project manager or a scrum master or a line manager. Uh, any type of role uh, you might play as a developer or even a tech lead. Um, we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, this is not about a right ways or wrong way of doing things, right? So all kind of leadership, project managers, come through, they all have different side of work. So it's no right or wrong things, but all is like it's just the way of like you're picking up things to make a good leader. Number three, um, this is not about repetitive admin tasks that leaders uh, often need to do. There are many invisible activities you might do like uh, admin work, uh, filling in forms, doing timesheets, uh, doing budgets and just approving people's leave. This talk is not about those invisible activities that you might do yes. that still add value. Mm. <clears throat> this talk is about leadership as a mindset. So, not a role, so it does of the title you have on your business cards, name cards, bestowed upon you. What does it mean by bestowed upon you? Bestowed upon you means like given to you from someone high above. No, so it's not about some title you have been given from someone higher above. Actually, there's no such thing like someone higher above because people are all equal, right? Like we are all humans. So, we uh, welcome anyone here to embed your mindset as a leader. So you don't need to have a title of project managers or scrum master to be in this room. One final ground rule. It's not a ground rule, it's more of a warning. Uh, it's a spoiler alert. So <laughs> we've, we've tried to be creative and a bit fun with some of the examples we use so you can relate to them. So if you are a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the Avengers uh, and you haven't seen it yet but you plan to see it uh, and you don't want to know what happens or who dies, 
Um, this is this is your first warning, first and final warning. Uh, Run! <laughs> uh, nobody's left yet, so I think everyone has seen it already. Okay. So they're true fans. Last ten. Run! <laughs> So everyone must know who this is then, I guess. Who is he? Is anyone here in the room know him? Yes, it's Nick Fury, director it's of Shield. Nick Fury. <laughs> oh, Nick Nick Fury. Nick Fury, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so Thai. Nick Fury, na. Okay. <laughs> He's a director of Shield uh, in Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, what about him? Yeah. Well, do you know what he does? In a movie, does he do anything? Hmm. Uh, he appeared in some movies here and there. Uh, something to do with the Avengers Initiative. Uh, but I never thought of him as a main character. Um, certainly, I don't think he's a superhero or he has any superhero powers. Um, what about you? Yeah, I guess it's hard to notice, right? Because uh, any tangible or visible action that Nick Fury took uh, he doesn't stand out in the same way as other superhero does, like Iron Man, Spider Man, like that, right? But he do a lot of things that is intangible things that he contribute that matter to the most of the success of the Avengers and to the world. You mean he's practicing our version of supportive leadership? Um, so maybe let's let's dig a little bit deeper into this, or maybe we need to understand this a little bit more. Um, what is it that is intangible? that should be made visible, at least after you, uh, we've gone through our talk today. <clears throat> yes, sounds interesting. So let's let, let uh, go through a little bit deeper of Nick's Fury version of supportive leadership, right? So he was the one who assembled all the original Avengers. Yes, that's true. And in order to do that, he needed to understand the capability, the strengths, the weaknesses of each and every superhero. He needed alignment with S.H.I.E.L.D., government forces, and he had to bring these alliances together to yes. build a united team. Yes, he also doing a high level management with the world, uh, stakeholder management, with the world, cons uh, with the world security council as well. So that's a lot of work to do. Yeah, I think clearly there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that maybe we missed. Um, the listening he does, the eavesdropping he does, the planning he does, the talking he does, spying, spying, all the things that uh, are required to make things happen to save the world seem, seems to be something that is there. So maybe he does have a superpower. Yes. Um, maybe actively doing nothing is the superpower. Yes. Maybe supportive leadership is the superpower. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's find out more. <laughs> So here is the cycle of our Benji framework for supportive leadership, right? So like, what, like I said earlier, there's no right or wrong, but this is what we can come up now for how we derive uh, our supportive leadership in our way. So we're starting with why to ensure the teams uh, aware of the common goals, having the same goal, have the alignment of what kind of purpose we are turning to together. And that requires a team building to make another way, another level of autonomy, autonomies, right? So when they feel like they have freedom of doing things, and with a uh, 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 safe environment that we create, uh, try to increase in the teams, then they could become another state of more mastery on what they're doing. They're doing things better in their own way. And then we can revisit towards the goal and always validate if it's always in the direction or the same direction or not, or the goal still valid or not. The circle can happen iteratively. Mm. Let's go. Did you draw that yourself? Yes. Mm. No typos. It's yeah. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, start with why. Okay, so we have a picture here. This isn't a superhero, but we do want to start with why. Uh, this is the face of a baby or a toddler um, that has just discovered a very powerful weapon, the ability to ask why. The desire to understand why begins very early on in human development. Anyone here who has children or toddlers aged between the age of two and four years old, may, or maybe you remember what it was like when you were this age. <clears throat> or maybe your current children remind you every day, or a niece or a nephew. And those, for those of you who do, then you might have experienced what it's like when you have to answer a toddler questioning you about anything and everything. And they do that with one simple word. Why? 
Why? Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the word for why in Thai is. is, it, is Tamai. It the same? Tamai. Mm. Yeah. And for a baby, I think, why wouldn't you use this superpower? The toddler has discovered one of the most powerful learning tools to help them learn, to help them satisfy their never-ending curiosity, a relentless hunger to attach meaning to the things that this baby is starting to see, to hear, to smell, to touch, and to taste. And all of this combined helps them to understand the world that they've been brought into in its most simplest form. Moving forward and then maybe coming back to your own lives as a student, as a professional, as a colleague or as a leader, it's natural for you because of evolution to start with wanting to know why. It makes perfect sense that the first thing you should ask, if not your team should ask, is also why. Um, answering the why, communicating this to yourself and your teams and keeping the message clear basically gives the team a sense of purpose. It gives them direction and it gives them meaning in what they do next. Equipped with a sense of these three things, direction, meaning and purpose, having answered why, you and your team should have a better ability to attach meaning to the things that you do. You should be able to better understand the value that your actions create and you should also have a sense of purpose uh, when you achieve something together. Here's another example. <laughs> <laughs> In case you're not a Marvel <laughs> fan. <laughs> From 1999. <laughs> yes, and more, uh, 20, 20 years ago now. So this is Tell Me Why. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, for those who don't know, uh, the reason why we thought this was a useful example is in any context really, as whether you're a baby, whether you're talking about the Avengers Initiative or whether you're talking about... Heartbroken song. Yeah, love songs or pop songs. Yeah. Um, people want to know why. And this is the second part of the song where I never want to hear you say I want it that way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if this is the way. I want. I never want to hear, hear you say. say. <laughs> I want it that way. <laughs> um, so if you're, uh, this happens a lot, like the pattern is not unusual uh, outside of this pop song. If uh, your manager or your colleagues uh, or your tech lead says, uh, that's just the way I want it, I want it that way, and they don't explain why, and you're expected to just follow the instruction. So this song is a reminder next time you hear about it, it's more than just about heartbreak, it's also about your life in your job. <laughs> I want it that way. <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> Let's come back to Nick Fury. Does anyone remember this scene in the movies? Anyone? Anyone? Oh. Okay. What is that happening? What is this scene about? Yeah. Who is it? Who is it? Too many questions. Okay. We can, <laughs> we can help you. <laughs> Uh, this is the scene after waking up from 70 years nap of uh, Steve Rogers. Nick Fury recruit uh, Captain America to join the Avengers. Yeah, it's at this moment that Steve Rogers asks, what are you doing here? What are you trying to do? Are you just trying to get me back into the world? And Nick Fury said, no, I come to you to save it. Yeah. So the reason why this is uh, a pivotal moment is because this is the beginning of the assembly of the Avengers. And you can see where it starts is a very simple conversation explaining um, to Captain America the why of why he wants to start this initiative. Yeah. Setting up the common goal. Yeah. We're going to move away a little bit from the, the cinematic theme for now and Rin will share a couple of other examples in why. Yes, uh, this is another experiment from Payout Books, right? Uh, it's about the red Lego robots. Uh, so, uh, there are two experiments running with two groups of people. One group is that uh, they have the, uh, the goal of having an incremental Lego robots, like one by one, setting up in sequence order like that. And another group, right? They'll, they have been assigned to uh, the same range of having uh, as many of Lego robots as well. But the thing is that uh, every time they need to build up the second one, they need to destroy it first and use the same parts coming up with the next Lego robot. So the control factor here is the wage. They will got uh, the same paid of what they are doing. It's not that they, when they're doing more, they will get more, but uh, they will receive the paid. Decrementally for each of the robots they create. 
like for example, uh, the first one that we have like two dollars. The second one we got paid like one point seventy five dollars. The third one is one point five dollars. So it's not uh, really uh, like I want more money. I want to create more. So do you guess which group will have more of Lego robots? Should we ask the audience? Make yes. sure they're still awake. Mm. <laughs> Who thinks that um, the second group will do it more? Ah. Who thinks the first group will do it more? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're confused now. Oh, uh, do you want to ask me a question? Is um, my instruction clear? Yeah, okay. just give them the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the answer is the first group, right? The first group managed to make like 11 Lego robots, while the second one managed to have like seven Lego robots. Why? It's so that people tend to stop being motivated to continue their work if they see their work doesn't have any meaningful. Like the second group got to see their work got destroyed right in front of them instead of see it incrementally. Uh, while the first group, right, it's so that the first group tend to contribute more when they know, they, when they know, when they see that, ah, oh, the number of robots is increasing. They see it, they know it, they feel the meaning of it. So they have more motivate to continue on it. And here is another example of crossword activities. Uh, the, experiment, uh, the experiment learning with three groups of people. The first one, group one, they need to circle the text from each of the paper, having the name written Stephen and Win, like that, right? And the second group, uh, they can do the same thing, but uh, they, don't, they can deliver it without someone shaking on it and no need for writing any names. The third group, they are doing the same thing, but they will manage to see like uh, what they have been delivered destroyed right in front of them. Okay, so uh, the same control factor, they will got the same page. No one will shake on their work, but we don't have to guess who will stop working the fastest. Obviously, it's a good tree, right? Because they don't feel like what they are doing has any meaning. They've got to see like the work that they have been contributed destroyed right in front of them. So it's meaningless for them of what they are doing, right? Because the meaning got to disappear. While the first group got, to, got the name written on it. So they have the credit. They have the ownership of what they are doing. So to ensure they understand the meaning and the purpose and, the, and to understand the work that is more meaningful to them, give them a credit. Always. Okay, we're coming back to the Avengers. Mm. Uh, anyone remember this scene? We want to close on the Y section with this scene. Um, <clears throat> happens during actually one of the sadder moments uh, in the Avengers uh, movies. Uh, Nick Fury in this scene reinforces the idea that the initiative of the Avengers um, was to bring together a group of remarkable individuals uh, and see if they could be even something more, if something even greater than their individual powers could represent. And it happens at a very traumatic time uh, when uh, they've lost one of the key members of their team. So uh, this is when Agent Coulson dies. Mm. So spoiler alert. <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> wrong, wrong order. <laughs> Um, so this is after he's died, the team's motivation is quite low. Uh, the thing that is still there is they still have a sense of why. They should still have a meaning and a purpose. They still need to save the world. They still know what they need to do. The key message here is that even in challenging and hard times, having meaning and purpose and direction, if you have that there as a baseline, it helps people to continue to band together to solve uh, problems. They can continue to move forward, even in good times as well as bad times. So it's a very critical point at the beginning, uh, before you even know how things will pan out. It's even more critical when things don't go right, that you have uh, the why established right, right at the beginning for yourself and your teams. We're going to move on from why. I think we've talked uh, enough about why for now. Let's talk about autonomy. autonomy. How do you feel? Eh? Ah. How do you feel about these pictures? Uh, I think you're asking how he feels uh, in uh, the picture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, doesn't look like he can move. His arms are tied. His legs uh, also cannot move. Uh, he doesn't look very happy. Uh, he looks sad. 
This is the visualization of not having autonomy. We can see where, like, when it's when we don't have the autonomy, it's hard to move. Even if you can move, it's not fast, it's not effective, and it's not happy. Yeah. So from another example of the payoff books, right? They also have to experiment about it to have the two group of people doing a folding of origami. The first group, they will have the well-written instructions, like step by step, with arrows on how they will fold it, step by step. And the second group, they have a minimal, uh, confusing instructions, and they have to figure out by themselves on how to do it. As you would expect, the guide group origami look a lot better. My question is, when we ask them how much they, they are willing to pay for their work, which group tend to pay more? The well instruction one, uh, let me see the hand of like, who do you think like the, in, the well instruction one, uh, the good looking origami one will pay more? Raise your hands up. Mm. Mm. Or do you feel like the do it yourself one with, with the confusing guy will pay more? Oh, they yeah. got it. <laughs> that is the right answer. So the do-it-yourself group, I'll be the first group by far. Uh, clearly putting all this work handmade, the result is more meaningful to them. It's like they have the time to figure out by themselves how to do it. And then it's like they can feel proud of them and it can be more meaningful to them. So this is the importance of having autonomy in the teams. Mm. I think we're ready for another case study from uh, Marvel. <laughs> this guy again. So let's come back to Nick Fury. Why? Uh, well, there's an important example here <laughs> about autonomy. Yeah, but again, he didn't do anything. That's kind of the point. We kind of said that already. It's, the, it's still the superheroes that we remember. The power of Iron Man suit or the hammer of Thor or the strength of the Hulk. Nobody really remembers or thinks about Nick Fury. But if you do think a little bit about it, Nick influenced almost everything that happened in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Firstly, like we mentioned earlier already, he was the one that recruited the original six Avengers yeah. and assembled them. So he brought together the Iron Man, Captain America, Hawk's Eye, Black Widow, Thor's. Where else? Where else? The Hulk. Uh, yeah, Hawk Eye. The Hulk. Mm. Uh, and what happened after the Avengers were assembled? Do you think he told them what to do? No. Actually, he can't. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So more importantly, after he assembled the group. Um, he left enough room for their individual contributions of these super superheroes to shine yeah. individually as well as ensuring that they worked effectively and contributed harmoniously as a team. He did it in a way that gave the team autonomy to solve the problems they faced, however challenging they were. Okay, so next, if you know about like what kind of meaning they are aiming for, they have the right goal, they have the vision shared, and freedom to make it happen. Imagine what will happen next. Mastery. mastery. What is mastery? Okay, mastery is the desire to get better and better at something that matters. Right, linking back to the, the theme that we presented before. This one. Okay, this one. Uh, as I said, to transfer from autonomy to mastery here is like, uh, you probably get familiar with this picture, the feedback loop, right? So it's a continuously actions of doing something, building some things, measure it, and learn from it, right? In the circle like this. It's the same method that we apply for mastery as well. This is the individual feedback loop, but how, as a leadership, that you will make it happen, right? So, it's very important for people to feel safe about it. The fast feedback loop can only happen when, like, uh, when you can make them to feel safe, to give the feedback, to receive the feedback, and to improve, to fail, and to learn. If they don't feel safe enough to learn, or to, in, uh, uh, in order to fail and do something better, 
they will start with doing something in the same way. So, why do we need feedback? Feedback is very important for improve the performance. Feedback can strengthen the confidence. Feedback is a tool for continuous learning and improvement, right? Talking about improving performance, why I use the term feedback? Why I don't use the term as go comment the work of your team? Go to tell them what did went wrong with your teams? Why? Because that kind of feeling make them aware of what they did wrong, but it didn't contain the awareness and the willingness of want them to be better, right? So it's not that you come up with a comment and you will call feedback. Feedback become a constructive feedback when you put some instructions on how they can do it better, put a good intention so it will, deliver, it will be delivered in a zone that they feel safe to be listened and adopt the advice or instructions about it and they can feel like they can improve it better. Because if you come up with a feeling of like, hey, you do something bad, you should do something better. Or why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? It will make people feel like more pressure and it's really hard to adopt, to listen on it. Even sometimes they know that it's, it doesn't feel right, the, the outcome doesn't feel like okay. So it's very important that you come with a willing to the person that I want you to improve. It's not that I'm going to tell you that you did wrong. So it's a, it's a two-way communication. Make them feel like they have been heard too. This could be a tool to trigger like on and explaining and co the combination on why they're doing things like that. So we both can learning together. Feedback can work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Feedback can strengthen confidence. What does it mean by strengthening confidence? It doesn't need to be to, uh, to always be like, hey, you are doing good. I feel like you want you you could do it better. But it also could be in a form of a gift. A compliment. Uh, it's very helpful to start practice as a leadership or anyone in the teams. It's a good value that you can bring that you are start looking on the positive side of people and make them feel like they have more confidence on what they're doing. A small uh, compliment as a gift to make them feel like, oh, this is something, some good behavior that I could, should keep up on doing it. Like, oh, you come so early. So it's you, you but, uh, it's, but please be like separate between a passive and aggressive, right? So you should come me with a, 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 a positive way of telling people that, hey, you are doing something good. Keep on doing it. Don't keep it to yourself. It is just a small gift that you can give to each other to ensure we are knowing that what we are doing good and we can continue doing things. You don't have to always come up to people just only when you want to tell them like, Hey, I'm not satisfied with your performance. Should, you should do something with it, right? So it's, it's, it's back and forth of like, it's hard for people to adopt your voice when you, are, what, when what you are always telling them is a bad thing about them. So you need to wait until like, you feel like they're not doing, uh, they're not really performing in the way you want them to, but also coming to them when they're doing something good as well. So feedback is a tool for continuous learning and improvements. So ensure you do it in such a way of continuous improvement, right? So uh, meaning like you encourage feedback to happen in order to accept that some that sometimes it's not always the case that we get the beautiful results in the beginning, but we don't we don't need to have a perfect result in the beginning, but it's a continued improvement so people feel safe to fail and to learn from it as well. So come back to management course. It's the continuous improvement that is better than the delayed perfections. Keep up moving on the fast feedback loop. Mm -hmm. So people yep. know like what's going on, they can contribute better. Yep. I think people will see in the next slide, so I think they know it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> We're back to the Avengers. Yeah. Do who, who, who is she? It's uh, Scarlet, your, no, it's a Black Widow. <laughs> uh, she's one of the Avengers. Yeah, so it's, the, it's required an ability to understand people's capability, right? Talking about mastery, you're not always just to throwing people's face on what mastery looks like. Hey, this is a perfect developer. Hey, this is a perfect PM. You have to have the character of doing this, doing that, 
good at this and bad at that. People have different strengths and characteristics, right? Some may be talkative, but someone who quiet might be very good at listening as well. So to understand that is, and to move forward to the same goal and agenda is much like Nick Fury does with the Avengers. Mm, well, one interesting thing about uh, Black Widow is uh, she was born with no superpowers. So yeah. how did she end up as a superhero? She also didn't got bitten by spider and she didn't got hit by any other stuff from the other planet. But what makes she is uh, what makes her as one of the member of the Avenger is her mastery of martial arts, all kind of weapons, spying, which come up by mastery herself in all of those things. That is also the superpower in the Avenger as well. Feedback. Hmm. Cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about team building. Uh, I guess we talk a lot about this um, in lots of different contexts. So we, I guess we want to share maybe two versions of uh, stories. Uh, the first one I'll start with is maybe a case study you have may or may not have heard of before. Uh, it's a case study about building the perfect team. So anyone heard of Project Aristotle? One hand, Yay, Shane. <laughs> Um, project Aristotle was a I call it experiment or a project or a case study in Google. Uh, they looked at 180 teams all over their organization to try to uncover what makes the perfect team. Um, is it those teams that socialize together outside the office? Uh, is it characteristics where everyone in the team has the same hobbies? Uh, everyone has the same educational background? Uh, everyone is all introverted or everyone's all extroverted. Um, is gender balance the key? It was impossible to find patterns uh, in this case study, uh, even looking at those 180 teams. Um, the who of who formed each of these teams didn't seem to matter or reveal any answers. Uh, interestingly, two of the teams uh, on paper looked like identical teams. Um, skill set wise, even personality profile wise, uh, but their performance and effectiveness was completely different. So even though Google is usually very good at finding patterns, in this case study the first thing they discovered was um, there were not any strong patterns here based on those characteristics of who you have in the team. Um, I'll skip uh, to, the, to the end um, part of this in terms of the results, but you can read more about it uh, online. They turned to psychology for some of the answers. Um, what, they, what they looked at and discovered was five different key areas that helped to form uh, the perfect team. Psychological safety was one uh, maybe not so obvious thing. The ability for everyone in the team to feel like they can take risks with their fellow team members. Uh, they won't be embarrassed or they won't be punished uh, by doing so. Dependability. So everyone is, uh, has a right to and will complete quality work. Structure and clarity. Everyone knows what their expectations are. Um, and those expectations are, are challenging uh, and tied to, to meaning, which is the fourth thing. Everyone has a sense of purpose in their work, and that's something we already talked about earlier, and it also came through in this case study. Uh, and the last one is around impact, um, which Arin also talked a little bit about earlier also. Everyone sees the result of their work is contributing towards an overall goal. So it's an int uh, interesting case study that you can also pick up and read the more de detailed version around, um, but it gives you some insights into what are the factors you should consider if you were asked to build the perfect team? What should you consider? What pitfalls or traps should you avoid? What appears on paper to be the perfect team? Maybe it's not. <clears throat> um, we're going to come back again to the Avengers. Uh, why are we coming back to, here, uh, to them again? Uh, right. So. <laughs> Interestingly, in the final battles of the Avengers, we discover that it's a very unique and it's a very specific team and sequence of events that allows the world to be saved. Only, only one team out of 14,605,000 possible scenarios was going to succeed. Uh, and uh, spoiler alert, oops, <laughs> wrong order again. <laughs> um, in order to save the world, all other combinations or scenarios was doomed to fail. So. Um, the, the point I'm highlighting here is uh, every team is unique. There are no two teams uh, that are the same. And uh, as part of this, 
what we do want to share is um, some tips from us in terms of team building. They're based on personal experience, um, so it's not, uh, don't cite us, it's... Yes. <laughs> Let's begin. Yes. So first one is to create a warm and welcoming environment, uh, to be open to being vulnerable as a leader. And we talked a little bit about the psychological safety in Project Aristotle already. Yeah, so you don't have to always have a smiley face or like a friendly characters. As we said, like we don't specify uh, any various characters in the teams. We also don't really uh, specify a certain specific of character as a leader as well. You can be your own way of leadership, but just having a safe feeling and warm welcoming is mm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And understand their motivations and what drives them to work in the morning. This will help understand on how, what motivate. If you understand what motivate them, you will understand more on what kind of conversation, what kind of uh, motivation and communication that that we can have towards to make team a team. Yeah. Uh, number three, recognize people, no matter how small or significant the achievement is. Uh, give people credit. Um, don't leave anyone in the team behind. It's important for people to feel proud of what they do, and it, uh, it's reinforced uh, as something meaningful uh, when people give them credit for what they do. Yeah, I got this right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, to, work, to work together as a team is a long-term relationship, right? Consider it's a long-term relationship. It's always needs, always required a communication along each other. So you having that aware in mind will make you feel more aware of like the interaction you will have towards to each other. Yep. Uh, number five, uh, add fun into what you do. So uh, you spend such a big percentage of your time uh, working with people, with teams, uh, with your colleagues. Um, make sure it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, and make feel make them feel more positive about themselves. As I said, uh, a compliment, a slightly small compliment a day is not doesn't cost anything, and it's help you and your team as, as a good example, right? You start to looking for something good about people, and you say it out loud. So that's an easy and simple way that they also like can feel good about themselves and they could pay it forward as well to the other team's members. Yep. Uh, number seven, support diversity. Uh, create diverse teams. This one is probably quite challenging to do. Uh, most people at the moment are still focused on gender as their version of a diversity commitment, but we're talking about more than just supporting gender diversity as a first step. We're talking about diversity from a race perspective, your ethnicity, your, gen uh, your sexual orientation. What do you mean by ethnicity? Ethnicity. Uh, kind of like, oh, it's complicated for me because I was born in one country, moved to another country, and now I'm in Thailand. Uh, but my ethnicity would be uh, Chinese or Vietnamese. So where, uh. you, where you relate to. Uh, generally. I'm not, not sure what the Thai word is. Anyway, <laughs> uh, socioeconomic status, your age, your physical abilities, your religious beliefs, your political beliefs, or other ideologies. Um, all of these uh, comprise what we define as diversity. Mm. You don't need to have uh, all the extrovert in a team. It could be a right mix of extrovert people with introvert people, like what, brought, like what we said before. like. Uh, some people were really good at talking, some people were really good at listening, so it's a kind of life that in a team, so we can have like an, a different angle on perspective or looking at things in the different ways. Mm -hmm. Oh, and next, it's ensure there's enough breathing space to apply the change. Like what we said, if we are here as a people, as a human, not machine or robots, right? We cannot just like keep uh, on working, spinning the wheel like a uh, factory mode. If we don't have enough space for breathing, then meaning that we are not giving the, the priority towards on the tasks that is important but it's not urgent yet, like planning stuff, uh, like process improving stuff. How do we learn? How do we improve ourselves? If we don't have any enough breathing space and keep wheel running, then it's hard to make a space for learning, hard to make for planning, hard to make a space for creativities. Mm. Mm. Yep. And number nine that we've left you with here is encouraging creativity. So um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll 
or I'll use a quick lesson here from uh, Creativity Inc. So the president of Pixar company came up with three tips for how to, how to build teams. You know the Pixar company? I know. Yeah. What movies are there from Pixar? Wall E. Toy Story 1. Fighting Nemo. Toy Story 2. <laughs> Cars. Toy Story 3. <laughs> Monster Inc. Toy Story 4. <laughs> a Bug Life? Toy Story. <laughs> no, there's no more Toy Story. It's not a competition. Yes. Anyway, the point is uh, Pixar is one of the most creative organizations in the world uh, and that, what, the work they do is inherently creative but obviously the culture itself has lessons for us to learn that are applicable uh, even if you're in the IT industry or, or in any other uh, field of work. The three things that they shared uh, in Creativity, Creativity Inc. are having a good team is more important than having a good idea or focusing on the individual who has the idea. Number two is never blame failures on individuals or single people. Uh, always an entire team responsible for an outcome. And the third one uh, from this mini case study is to encourage employees to decorate their own workspaces. Yeah, I applied to myself too. I have a teeny small tree putting everything together. I feel very like really more relaxed. And when I feel more relaxed, I can feel like I can easier to have a Eureka moment or aha moment during the day. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So there's some ideas for you to also encourage creativity in your in your team. What happened to the tenth number ten item? Do we have number ten? No, I don't think we did. <laughs> 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 All right, let's move on from team building to making people feel safe. Yes. Okay. Making people feel safe. I choose the pictures here is the moms and the baby. But you don't have to be a mom to your team. You don't have to be that parents. But uh, it's just a refer to a comfortable feeling where you can take a, a sleeve and let the people doing something or like something, some kind of a safe, safe feeling that you have with each other. Let's go more into a little bit details about it. Here is the uh, concept uh, from the same order of start with why, Simon Sinek, right? It's called a circle of safe. Uh, back then, uh, in the early days of Homo sapien eras, the world still filled with dangers. We are live in the wood. We have tigers, lions, dinosaurs, and people tend to live together in the same circle, so they could feel more safe. Why they feel safe in this circle, right? It's a natural reaction when we are having trust together and collaborations. Like they can have, when they are sick together with trust and collaborations, meaning like someone can take a nap when someone, when know, uh, peacefully when knowing someone is watching for the dangers outside as a security guard. Or like they feel trust enough for people and collaborate enough to take turns in sleeping and like knowing someone will take some action if the tiger is coming. So it's the meaning of circle of safe. People are living in a group with trust and collaborations. Back into now today, the world still filled with dangers, with a lot of uh, uncontrolling factors. Dangers here could, it could not be a, it's no longer a tiger, it's no longer a um, dinosaur or lions. It could be something that we cannot control, like trade wars, economics, um, earthquake, flood the market itself, right? So the only things, the only variables are the conditions in the organization in our circles. And that's where the leadership matter because the leader is the one who set the tone right. So when people feel safe, right? They feel like they belong. They feel like Remark then, then they, when they feel like they belong, the remarkable things happen, right? So if the conditions are wrong, if the tone is wrong, then we are forcing people to spend their own energy, like look at ourselves, protecting ourselves from each other, worry about like having someone stepping behind our back, having uh, someone may talking behind my back in such a bad way. That is not a feeling of representing how they feel safe in the circle. So set the tone right is very important. So have, so shall we link a bit between like the, the why and the trust, right? Um, when people tend to have 
the same common goal of what they believe and the object in what they do, they tend to have a common belief, right? They tend to have a common value where they could feel more trust to each other, so it's helping. What does it mean by trust? Some, uh, when you're simply doing everything that you promise, does it mean that you can be trust? No. It means you are reliable, right? So here trust came from a sense of common value and belief, which later become a culture. And uh, we could know, uh, easily notice a sim uh, and simple symptom of the organization where, where, they can, where they have like a culture or trust issue is that people start feeling stressed, worry about being attacked. Like, and instead of doing something great, the passion is down. People tend to become uh, like survival mode, protecting themselves from each other. So that is a symptom where you can like feel it when it happens. So how do we build trust? Uh, here we would like to talk about how do we build trust, right? So I believe nothing could replace a human interactions, right? Trust come from a human interactions where it couldn't be replaced by any kind of social network. That's why we all have a lot of business trips going on in the world because the video conference is not enough, right? It's what we are recommending you here is like we can learn each other value and belief when we interact with them, right? Plus it's human, human interactions, right? It's about the conversation that we have with them. It's about like the interaction that we have with them. It's a certain distance with each other that we can do a real-time handshake. So that's how we start with time. Uh, I have a fruitful conversation this lunch that I would like to share with you as well on how Shane illustrated is in the pictures on what trust is. So imagine trust as a bucket. At first, you need to always fill it in, right? Uh, with a far away distance or a video conference or far away distance, the trust here in the bucket become draining over and over. So you, from time to time, you need an human interaction to fill in the bucket again. Keep it in that way. It's, it, and it didn't mean that uh, video conference is prohibited, but it is something that you need to interact with people to fill in that trust bucket. Because why is that matters to the leadership is because like when you seem to manage people by authority, you're looking at the screen, you're looking at the graph and the number, the revenues, your KPIs, your velocities, your story points. You take a look at number and screen. You don't know them. You don't know what motivates them. You don't really know what happens. You don't empathize. And we don't trust, and, um, and, and, it's, and after the only thing we have is authority, not the leadership, right? So, being in a distance to have a real handshake, share why to have a common belief in the same goal, setting the tone right, and then people will, see, will feel safe to learn and to grow together. So here is our summaries about our talk today. So let's come back to remind you a bit on our circles here. We start with why to ensure people know what is the common goal to go towards together. It's not just telling them like, hey, this is a goal. Let's make like level X, 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 but it's more like a why we are doing this. What kind of value we do it? It's a why do you wake up and make this more meaningful? It's about something like knowing that they get up to work and knowing that they would like uh, doing someone's, some people uh, to improve people's lives better even in a small way. Make it more meaningful. So if, it's, if the work is meaningful, even the palong. Uh, Jenny. Janita. Janita. What? <laughs> Do you want to clean? Oh, Janita, yeah. Janita. 
Also, even the <laughs> my English. Even the janitor themselves can also knowing in the airport, knowing that they are making people flowing, like people's life is getting better by I'm I'm cleaning this will make people's life more floatable. They don't have to spit on the water the on the floor just because like the water is there. It's make their life more meaningful. They woke up and feels like what they're doing has a purpose, right? So after know the purpose, the why of what they're doing things, come up with the team building and team can have more autonomy together and we make them feel safe to learn from each other with a fast feedback, fast feedback loop. So they could become a must, uh, mastery of what they are doing in their own way. We could revisit again and whether that if it still work towards on the same goal that we are setting or not. And what should we improve about it? What is the learning? about it. We can learn it together, right? And come back to him again. Yeah. I don't think we have anything to say about him. Just for completeness, we added him here. <laughs> um. No, it's about like when we are actively doing these things to happen, right? They may not be visible or easily measurable or even seems like nothing, right? But we do recommend that we encourage you to do this thing to happen. Because we believe this is the right thing to do to make the team a good team. Last but not least, uh, we would like to leave you with a quote here, right? The most easiest key takeaway of being the leadership that we believe is um, the leader is not the person who is the highest rank, but is the person who look after people uh, the left to them and the, peop and the person who look after people to the right to them and this is what a leader is so it's a choice not a rank thank you very much Ooh. thank you Kun Rin and Stephen uh, for our uh, Avengers spoil uh, thank you na. <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> so any question from the from the group? Ah, okay. Okay. They are clearly about the Avenger right now. Yeah, so the one thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so please give a big clap again for them.